Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 20 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers, myself Dr. Abhishek Kumar. This particular lecture is basically part 4 of the topic local side effect and ground response analysis. As we have discussed in lecture 17, 18, 19, a prior information about the site where ground motion record is available as well as the soil properties which are available beneath the bedrock, uh, beneath the ground surface and above the bedrock are required in order to find out how the properties of input motion, how the properties of bedrock motions are going to get altered because of the local soil. We have also discussed that considering the properties of the soil which are going to offer resistance to external loading condition are dynamic in nature. We have discussed in terms of uh, KV solids that the resistance you are getting primarily by means of shear modulus as well as damping ratio if you are talking about damped soil. So, these two parameter which is uh, uh, which are defining the dynamic soil properties that is shear modulus and damping ratio are actually not constant for a particular soil, but are dynamic in nature as the name suggests. Now, when we say dynamic, it means depending upon the level of shear strain, a soil experience whether during a particular earthquake, whether corresponding to a particular confining pressure, whether corresponding to a particular effective stress, whatever may be the controlling parameter, but depending upon the shear strain which is mobilized in a particular soil layer that will define what particular value of shear modulus, what particular value of damping ratio will be used in order to control the response of that particular soil. If you remember the governing equation of motion which was given in terms of displacement correlated with respect to g value that is shear modulus as well as chi value that is damping ratio. So, in that particular equation when we are trying to solve that particular equation then applying boundary conditions what value of g what value of damping ratio to be used that will be depending upon the level of shear strain which is induced in a particular soil layer. Now, when we discussed in lecture 17, lecture 18 we had highlighted very clearly that local side effect particularly when you are going with numerical approach that is ground response analysis you can have more than one method. One is linear method which we have discussed in lecture 18 and lecture 19. In linear method the properties the dynamic soil properties of the soil are assumed initially and then accordingly the solution of the particular equation is obtained. Firstly, we will try to find out what is the bedrock motion corresponding Fourier amplitude, then using the frequency content of input motion, shear wave velocity of medium, thickness of the medium, we try finding out the transfer function. Product of these two, again whenever I am telling uh, transfer function, the value of V s is going to remain constant, the value of damping ratio is going to remain constant and then we will multiply with respect to Fourier amplitude of bedrock motion that will give you Fourier amplitude at the top of that particular soil layer which is having a thickness of capital H if we are referring to lecture 18 as well as lecture 19 that will give you the value of ground motion in four years in frequency domain at the top of the soil layer. Then as we have seen in lecture 19 how we can separate how we can convert this ground motion from frequency domain to time domain by means of inverse fast Fourier transformation. Once it is done we will have real part and imaginary part. So, further you will be taking only the, image, the real part to determine the acceleration time history at the ground surface which is representation of how much is the ground shaking in time domain which has been transferred from a particular bedrock motion by virtue of a particular soil layer available at a particular site and then going to the surface. So, if we clearly observe the process which has been followed in lecture 18 as well as in lecture 19, clearly we had defined the value of transfer function using some initial assumptions and the value of shear modulus and the damping ratio was considered constant. 
Now, in the beginning of this particular lecture and again in lecture 18, lecture 19, we have discussed that there are properties of the soil that is shear modulus and damping ratio are not constant rather keeps on changing depending upon the shear strain induced in a particular soil layer. So, actual re soil response is non-linear, but we are trying to approximate it with respect to linear approach as we have discussed in lecture 18, lecture 19. Please remember that linear approach of ground response analysis is generally followed for lower value of shear strain, maybe in the range of 0.2 percent, 0.3 percent of shear strain, not higher than that. Because if we start understanding the dynamic soil properties, whether you talk about shear modulus, whether you talk about damping ratio, both of these properties do not show significant variation in low value of shear strain. So, in case you are dealing with a ground motion which is inducing very low value of shear strain, you can use linear approach and try determining the response of a particular soil layer that will give you reasonably accurate results. Because though you are going with linear analysis, which primarily you will be using very low strain corresponding shear modulus and damping ratio value of the soil and using the transfer function using the Fourier amplitude at the bedrock, you will be determining the Fourier spectra at the surface. However, one has to be very careful while using linear approach of ground response analysis you cannot use the linear approach which has been discussed in previous two lectures to any value of shear strain, because as you keep on going for intermediate or higher value of shear strain, there are more chances that the shear strain corresponding initial values which you have taken into account are actually not governing the response of the soil. What it means if you go with local side effect assessment using linear approach and the bedrock motion is such that it is inducing significantly higher value of strain such that the value of strain is not corresponding to or the value of dynamic soil properties are not corresponding to very low value of strain, but these have significantly changed from very low value. Let, let me show you with respect to the example. Uh, let, let, let me start this particular topic and then we will go with uh, whatever I am trying to highlight with respect to issues with linear approach as a result of which we will go with other methods. So, lecture 20 which is uh, uh, part 4 of ground response analysis that will be the last lecture on this particular topic of ground response analysis, where we will try to understand about the limitations of linear approach and then some overview about equivalent linear and non-linear methods. Please understand that this particular lecture will only give you an overview about equivalent linear and some information about non-linear method. Non-linear ground response analysis itself is a big topic. So, covering entire topic in one lecture will not be possible. We will be restricting it to very brief introduction about non-linear approach. So, topic which has been covered in last class was how to determine the Fourier spectra or subsequently the acceleration time history at the top of damped soil layer which is located above rigid half space. Now, if we continue that particular topic, one question will come to our mind, what if even the rock is elastic half space. So, in such a case, we will try it again, we will we'll go back again to the step where we were trying to find out the solution of one dimensional equation of motion. Once we tried finding out the solution in terms of u, we had approximately considered that the strain compatibility at rock and bottommost soil layer interface is same or it is following the compatibility condition. The same equation will be applicable over here, but similar to the case of damped soil, there was inclusion of damping ratio in soil medium when we go for elastic rock as well there will be additional component of damping ratio in the rock medium. So, that damping ratio component in the rock medium will also be useful when we are trying to satisfy the compatibility equation at rock soil interface. When we are and this compatibility because it is correlating some coefficients in soil layer 
with respect to some coefficient in rock layers and this particular rock layer is the layer in which the bedrock motions are available. Subsequently, this motion will be compared with respect to the pre surface condition where A equals to B condition we have seen in case of lecture 17 and lecture 18. So, that is how we can correlate even the damping ratio of elastic rock medium, the damping ratio of soil medium with respect to coefficients and subsequently we can use it for determining the transfer function for this particular soil layer. So, subsequently there can be topics like we started with undamped soil over rigid half space, we had some value of transfer function which was independent of any imaginary function because there was no damping ratio. So, simply we, we transferred motion from the bottom of an undamped layer to the top of that particular layer by multiplying with transfer function. That is the approach for linear ground response analysis. That means, the solution which we have used, the solution which is or the transfer function which we are using, it is a function of G value or V s value as well as the damping ratio, but throughout the solution these values are not changing. That is why this particular method which we have been discussing in lecture 18, 19 and even some part in lecture 20 that belongs to linear ground response analysis. Linear means you are considering that the properties of the soil are not at all changing. In general, in reality the properties of soil that means shear modulus, damping ratio this keep changing, but because in the solution so far whatever we have discussed these are not changing, we are categorizing this part of the solution as linear ground response analysis, where we are actually not checking once we are getting the surface uh, acceleration time history, we are not actually checking whether the value of V s, the value of damping ratio which was utilized in transfer function has actually been mobilized or some different values of shear wave velocity as well as damping ratio is mobilized. So, in linear ground response analysis we are not at all bothered about what was the initial assumptions in terms of dynamic solve properties and what is the final results in terms of acceleration time history or shear strain which you are getting as the output of your ground response analysis problem. So, this is one limitation with respect to linear ground response analysis, but as I mentioned though it is a limitation, but considering the fact that for majority of the sites the dynamic solve properties are not at all available uh, covering the entire range of shear strain. So, still if your site is not susceptible to very high value of shear strain, the you can go with linear ground response analysis and it will give you a reasonably accurate result. So, we started with undamped soil, then we brought damped soil in lecture 19 over rigid half space, then subsequently we can go to elastic half space. So, you will have additional component of damping in uh, uh, rock medium using that particular thing compatibility equation, free surface condition, you tried solving that equations and come up with what will be the functional form of your transfer function. Multiply that transfer function corresponding to all the values of operating frequencies or omega values and then you will get transfer function throughout the frequency range. Multiply these value of transfer function with respect to Fourier amplitude of bedrock motion, you will again get very much similar to lecture 18, lecture 19, the value of Fourier spectra at the top of the soil layer and then go for inverse fast Fourier transformation, you can go with acceleration time history determination. Same way, if you continue this particular problem, there can be bedrock and above that particular bedrock there can be n number of soil layers, which is most of the time available in physical conditions at the site. So, in such a case what we will do, we will take bedrock condition into account, determine the transfer function between bedrock and the bottom most soil layer and try determining how the values of coefficients of bedrock are correlated with respect to the A and B coefficients of bottom most layer. Considering that at bottom most layer of soil and rock layer the compatibility equation will be satisfied. Then same way you go to second last layer from the or second layer if you start moving from bottom to the top. So, second soil layer again the compatibility equation between top mo bottom most layer and the layer above it has to satisfy. So, that is how you can correlate the value of A and B coefficients of bottom most layer with respect to 
second layer. If there are tenth layer, so you go with tenth layer to ninth layer, then ninth to eight, and subsequently you will reach to first layer. Why first layer is important? Because the bot the topmost part of the first layer will be indicating free surface condition. And if you remember, free surface condition, the value of A and B were equal in that particular case. So subsequently, you will get the value of A and B for the topmost layer. And since these have been correlated with respect to A and B coefficients for each of the ten layers, you will be able to determine the value of coefficients A and B for all the layers with respect to the topmost layer. Now, if you are interested to find out how the motion is getting transferred from the bedrock to each of these ten layers, you can determine the value of transfer function at the each of these layers. Repeat the same procedure which has been developed in lecture 18, lecture 19. That's how you bedrock motion can be transferred from bedrock to the top of bottommost layer, then to next layer top, then to next layer top, and subsequently you can get how much is the modified ground motion by each of these layers till the motion reaches to the topmost layer. So, that can be another uh, possibility when we go for ground response analysis. So, approach will remain same only thing is in linear approach we will not be checking that whatever is the final outcome you are getting as acceleration time history whether that acceleration time history is also mobilizing same value of shear strain which corresponding to the well corresponding to which the initial value of V s initial value of damping ratio has been used in determining the transfer function, because this is linear approach. So, advantage of linear approach is it gives you direct solution you, you, you just take two values of uh, dynamic properties one for shear modulus one for damping ratio and then try determining the transfer function and subsequently you can go to the solution. You can go for deconvolution also. So, convolution means you are going from bedrock to the surface. Deconvolution means if you are having some value at the outcrop, using deconvolution, you can determine if the same material properties remain same, what will be the bedrock ground motion if you are having in the same medium which is exposed to the ground surface, if you are having ground motions available, how that particular motion values. This is a place where motion is available, and this is n number of layers in the soil soil layer 1 layer 2 layer 3 so this was your outcrop motion which has to be transferred to the bedrock medium because we have been defining the transfer function with respect to bedrock medium. We are also using the value of omega corresponding to bedrock ground motion. So, this motion will be transferred that will be called as deconvolution. So, deconvolution you transfer the motion from the outcrop to the bedrock or below the soil layers and then in direct uh, in linear ground response analysis again you will try determining the f omega that is the transfer function at one that will help you in tra transferring the motion from bedrock to the top of that particular soil layer again determining the value of transfer function for second layer from the bottom you will you will be able to transfer the motion from bottom layer to the top of that particular second layer again you will be having f omega. So, if you are having n number of layers you can determine the transfer function corresponding to n number of layers and subsequently you will get finally, what is the value at the ground level. So, depending upon your linear approach you can use same values without checking whether the strain compatibility condition based on the solution and initial assumptions are made or it is matching or not then you can say it is like the approach which you are following here is following linear ground response analysis. Limitation is it does not take into account soil nonlinearity. as I mentioned if you are dealing with 0 0.5 percent, 1 percent, 2 percent strain shear strain in the soil which are mobilized because of external loading condition certainly you will end up in underestimating 
the nonlinear soil properties or local side effect. So, you will end up in you, you will not get actually whatever supposed to be the modified ground motion because of particular soil layer corresponding to a particular ground motion because you have considered initial assumption of dynamic soil properties and the methodology which you have adopted is, is not letting you modify your dynamic soil properties at later stage of your solution. So, the approach depending upon the approach you may or may not modify. So, the process of determining the ground uh, local side effect or performing ground response analysis the basic structure will remain same as far as linear and equivalent linear is concerned only thing there will be additional com, uh, conditions or checks when you move from local side effect based on linear analysis to equivalent linear analysis primary because it is not taken into account the linear approach is not taken into account the soil non-linearity. Now, second part is uh, the second method that is called as equivalent linear ground response analysis. The main advantage here is you will be able to check whatever initial assumptions in terms of shear strain or whatever initial assumption in terms of shear modulus and damping ratio you have taken to start solving this particular equation solving the equation whenever we are trying to find out the transfer function. So, here we will be finding out in the end of the solution whether the initial assumptions of shear strain was correct or it needs a modification. So, if it is found correct you can go ahead with the solution if it requires any modification. So, you can you can go again with modification again solve the equation. So, there is it is like iterative process you go with iterative process and find out till the initial assume assumed values and the values you are getting in the final form both are within some threshold values. So, equivalent linear analysis as is suggests though it is not linear ground response analysis, but it is not non-linear analysis also. So, it is basically trying to find out based on equivalent properties of soil equivalent properties which are available or which are known at a particular value of shear strain based on which you can actually approximate to significant accuracy the dynamic properties or the dynamic behavior of the soil. The method involves modification of linear properties. Linear properties means I am referring to linear ground response analysis. So, if you refer to the governing equation of motion which is given over here for K B solids you can see the displacement values or the external loading condition because you are having some value of shear stress also it is a function of shear modulus and the damping ratio. What we did in linear analysis we consider initial values and bent for calculation of transfer function then multiply the transfer function with Fourier amplitude got the value of the surface and then determine the acceleration time history. In the end when we are determining acceleration time history there should be a way where we can check that particular acceleration time history you are getting at the ground surface whether corresponding to that acceleration time history the shear strain which will be mobilized in the soil will also be corresponding to these values of shear modulus and damping ratio. What I am trying to highlight here is you, you, you took some initial assumption in linear analysis now in equivalent linear analysis once you are finding out the acceleration time history you will be also checking that corresponding to that acceleration time history how much is the shear strain mobilized in the soil layer primarily at the center of that particular soil layer. And once that shear strain values again because it is continuous loading you will be getting shear strain time history. So, from shear strain time history you can find out peak strain and subsequently reference strain that reference strain will give you an indication whether corresponding to that reference strain if you go with dynamic soil properties of the soil layer corresponding to which these were the initial assumptions whether that dynamic properties corresponding to reference shear strain is corresponding to these values or not. If these values are not corresponding to the same value of shear strain subsequently that indicates that the ground motion you are mobilizing or the ground motion which is getting generated in a particular soil layer because of some input motion is actually generating different value of shear strain and not the value which you have used as initial assumption. 
So, to start the problem, to start solving the problem, initial assumption is fine, but whenever we are giving the final proposition of the results, we have to make sure that the dynamic soil properties which we are giving as a part of the solution are actually being mobilized in the soil layer. So, in go, when we go for equivalent linear analysis, again we are not dealing actually with non-linear part, but the non-linear properties are actually approximated with respect to equivalent linear properties. So, we will be dealing with non-linear part or we will be dealing with change in dynamic soil properties, whether it is shear modulus, whether damping ratio, how it is changing as you keep on loading the soil sample cycle after cycles. That means, when we are determining the dynamic soil properties in laboratory, we keep on loading the sample, unloading the sample, loading, unloading the sample. As a result of which corresponding to each cycle of loading, you will be getting some value of stress strain curve. From that particular stress strain curve, you can find out how much approximately how much is the value of shear modulus. You, you can find out based on the initial part of stress strain curve corresponding slope. Similarly, with respect to the area under stress strain curve, you can find out how much is the strain energy accumulation and subsequently the damping ratio. That means, the stress strain curve at that time when the soil is subjected to cyclic loading. So, in each cycle of loading corresponding to whatever stress strain curve is getting generated, which is going to give you an indication about how much resistance in terms of shear modulus, how much resistance in terms of strain energy accumulation or damping ratio the soil is offering at that particular cycle of loading. Then you will unload the sample, again reload the sample. As a result of this process, whatever the value of shear modulus and damping ratio was available from the soil in first cycle of loading will change. You will go to second cycle of loading. So, there will be some shift in the, the hysteresis loop, which comes in dynamic soil properties. So, that means certainly you will have some value of, we, we will discuss uh, some preliminary information about dynamic properties. So, what actually happens when you, you uh, load a soil sample to cyclic loading or repeated loadings, loading and unloading, there will be degradation in the material property, there will be change in the damping properties of the particular soil layer and why it is happening? Because of the inherent properties of the soil, there will be degradation in the material properties. So, you can see if same uh, soil subjected to more number of repetition of cycle, there will be degradation in the material properties, there will be change in the damping properties of the soil. As you keep on continuing the loading, that means you are going from very low value of strain to intermediate to high value of shear strain. So, when we go with equivalent linear analysis, we are actually trying to find out approximately corresponding to each loading of cycle, what is the approximate properties of the soil, which though are not taking actual non-linear profile into account, but is giving you significant accuracy in terms of dynamic properties. Those dynamic properties you will be using over here in an iterative process and in the end you will be also checking whether it is matching with the strain compatibility. That means, the initial assumed shear strain and the value of strain corresponding to the final acceleration time history. If these two values are matching, you can say I have reached to the final uh, solution. If these are not matching, you will go for subsequent iterations. So, initial value in equivalent linear analysis, similar to linear analysis, an initial value of shear modulus and damping ratio, generally corresponding to very low value of shear strain, you take into account corresponding to that, you put the values in g and chi and then start solving the equation and get the transfer function very much similar to your linear approach. Only thing the same procedure you will be checking again and again in order to ensure that shear strain which is there at the beginning of the iteration and the shear strain which you are getting at the end of the iteration both are matching very closely with respect to each other. So, initial value of uh, shear modulus generally referred to secant modulus and damping ratio again corresponding to the area under stress strain curve you can assume these values, start solving the equation. The equivalent linear shear modulus, which is going to be also defined as secant modulus and the equivalent linear damping ratio, which will produce same energy loss 
in single cycle as happened in actual loading of the cycle. So, hysteresis loop which will be coming into picture when you start loading unloading the sample and continue the loading and unloading for higher number of cycles you will be getting in the terms of hysteresis loop which will actually define what is the uh, what, what is the nature of soil when it is subjected to cyclic loading repeated loading and unloading. So, that is defined by hysteresis loop. Now, the value of g and chi which you have used as initial assumptions over here you put in the solution determine the transfer function transfer the motion determine the acceleration time history again check based on strain time history how much compatible these initial assume you, you can see over here this is corresponding to secant modulus. So, if, if we see the hysteresis loop this value of secant modulus will be corresponding to some value of shear strain this value of equivalent damping ratio will also be corresponding to the same value of shear strain. So, in the end you are getting acceleration time history and corresponding to that you will be getting shear strain. You can check whether that value of shear strain and this value of shear strain are actually compatible or close with respect to each other. If it is not the value of shear modulus and damping ratio which are mentioned over here in the end these should be consistent. That means, whatever the initial assumptions in terms of shear strain was there that should be consistent with respect to the shear strain which is mobilized in a particular soil layer at the end of the iteration. If it is not then you go for subsequent iterations and keep on modifying the value. So, input required generally for uh, equivalent linear analysis are dynamic solve properties when we say dynamic solve properties that means, how the shear modulus value is changing with respect to shear strain how damping ratio is changing with respect to shear strain which can be obtained based on cyclic test in the laboratory and other methods are also there based on which in situ measurements also can be done uh, in order to determine the dynamic properties. So, these are the properties for in situ soil one has to know where when uh, one is trying to attempt for ground response analysis. So, the change in shear modulus with respect to shear strain it is called as modulus reduction curve how the shear modulus is changing with respect to shear strain or increase in shear strain that is called as modulus reduction curve and how the value of damping ratio is changing as you continue loading the same soil for very low to intermediate to high value of shear strain that will come under damping ratio curve. So, these two properties if someone asks what is the dynamic soil properties so generally we can refer to the shear modulus reduction curve as well as the damping ratio curve of the soil which is actually available at a particular site that is called as dynamic soil properties. Then bedrock motion corresponding to which this particular soil layer whose dynamic property we just spoke about will undergo modification bedrock motion should be there. Then subsoil properties water table depth if you are taken into effective stress. Uh, effect on shear strain also into account. Now, we can see over here. So, this is one typical cycle of loading you can see over here you started loading the sample and corresponding to stress strain curve you started loading the sample once it reaches to a particular value to started unloading the sample. So, loading the sample and removing the load again the sample will experience some kind of you can see over here and then again you start loading the sample. Now, this is one complete cycle if you continue this particular cycle I mean if you go for more number of cycle you will see. So, initially if you see this particular loading part approximately corresponding to the initial part whatever is the value of slope between shear stress strain curve that is indication of initially what is the value of shear modulus which is called as g max which because it is corresponding to very low value of shear strain. Again you can see based on the value shown over here joining with respect to the origin you, you can find out how much is the secant modulus of that particular first level of cycle. If you continue this particular loading unloading you can see over here this particular part is actual indication of 
how the secant modulus normalized with respect to maximum shear modulus is changing if you keep on increasing the shear strain values. So, this is again for same soil I have shown multiple number of curves because for different different soils, but if you take any particular curve you can see the same soil you keep on loading the soil sample you can see actually there is reduction in the shear modulus of the soil. At the same time if you keep on loading the soil for higher number of cycles there will be increase in the damping ratio as a result you see on one side when the shear strain is increasing there is reduction in the shear modulus of the soil, but at the same time there is increase in the damping ratio soil remain the same if you talk about the soil corresponding to low value of shear strain you see the soil is offering very high value of shear modulus very low value of damping ratio these two values will go into your solution determine the transfer function multiply the transfer function with Fourier amplitude you will get some value of acceleration time history in linear approach. If you are going with equivalent linear approach these may be the initial assumptions you try determining the acceleration time history you may get okay, this may not be the value of shear strain which is actually mobilized. So, corresponding to revised value if this is the value of shear strain you are getting based on your surface acceleration time history you take these two parameters into account or modified values of shear modulus and damping ratio put again in your solution try determining the transfer function try determining the acceleration time history at the surface again corresponding to acceleration time history or shear strain time history determine the reference strain match with if that reference strain is corresponding to this value if it is matching you stop your process if it is not matching then take that particular reference strain modify again your dynamic soil properties and that is how step by step at some stage what will happen the initial assumed values because these initial assumed value in third step is coming from second step in second step it is coming from first step. So, these initial assumed value at the beginning of the iteration and the value of shear strain you are getting at the end of the iteration at some stage these two values will match that will ensure that the value of shear strain which is mobilized in the soil layer corresponding to the same value of shear strain you are actually determining the transfer function you are determining the response of the soil that is basically the nature of or that is how you, you are differentiating with respect to linear ground response analysis and going into equivalent linear ground response analysis. So, one dimensional ground response analysis will be carried out by updating the level of shear strain through iterative process as I mentioned at the end of this particular process whatever you have done in linear analysis also once you determine acceleration time history you can also determine shear strain time history. If you remember uh, lecture 17, 18 we, we also determined shear strain value. So, subsequently you can determine shear strain time history corresponding to that value of shear strain time history pick up the peak value then determine reference strain from that compare this reference strain corresponding to how much is the value of shear strain which you have used assume initially whether modification is required whether modification is not required that can be done and subsequently you can continue with the procedure. So, the procedure will be continued till the time the effective shear strain which was used as initial assumption and what you are getting at the end of your iterative process when these two values of shear strain are compatible with respect to each other generally the difference between these two should be less than 10 is to the minus 2 minus 3 or as per the user defined approach. The effective strain it is it is seen that the effective strain of transient record because this is not harmonic motion which we are we will be applying. So, effective strain case of transient record may vary from 50 percent to 70 percent. So, here generally the value of 65 percent or 0 0.65 times the maximum shear strain is referred to as effective strain which will ensure that the rate of pore pressure generation in actual soil and here corresponding to harmonic loading and corresponding to transient loading that will be maintained. So, output will yield acceleration time history 
at various depth as I mentioned for linear analysis also in equivalent linear analysis also wherever you are interested to find out acceleration time history just keep on determining the transfer function or amplification uh, factor because amplification factor you can determine layer by layer also or any two layers because you will be having the value of coefficients. So, it is up to the user to determine the value of uh, the, the coefficients a and b with respect to the topmost layer or any other layer in between. Accordingly, one can determine the acceleration time history at any value of any particular soil layer and subsequently the value of peak ground acceleration which is the peak value of acceleration time history recorded at that particular soil layer. So, same procedure if you adopt for n number of layers you can determine how the variation in peak ground acceleration with respect to depth at a particular soil layer subjected to a known earthquake loading and having maybe 10, 15 number of soil layers will be there. So, if you look into the procedure of equivalent linear analysis, it is the same thing which we have mentioned uh, in the previous slide. You, you go for initial assumption of shear modulus and damping ratio value, try performing the ground response analysis and determine the acceleration time history. Corresponding to acceleration time history, you also determine the shear strain time history corresponding to the peak value from shear strain time history determine which is given over here multiply with respect to your reference factor which is given as 0.65 or generally this value of m you can refer to as 7.5. So, this is going to give you the value of reference factor as 0.65 multiply this 0.65 with respect to the peak shear strain you will get reference shear strain corresponding to reference shear strain for next set of iteration or for next cycle of iteration determine or update your value of damping ratio and shear modulus for to next cycle. Remember in this particular part you have assumed some value. So, this is revised value again if the shear strain is matching with respect to these particular values of shear modulus you can stop the iteration if the shear modulus and damping ratio which you have used in the initial assumption corresponding to these two values if the shear strain what was there at the beginning if it is not matching with the shear strain coming over here you can again go for you can again determine the value of shear modulus and damping ratio corresponding to this value of shear strain as initial assumption repeat the same procedure determine the value of gamma effective if you are getting same value it is fine if you are getting different value again go no update the value corresponding to gamma effective and keep on repeating the procedure till the value of shear strain getting in two subsequent stages as initial assumption and the output are falling within user defined threshold value. So, this is this particular procedure where the iterative procedure is coming into picture or where this no thing is coming into picture that defines or that differentiates equivalent linear ground response analysis with respect to linear ground response analysis. In previous slide, we discussed about equivalent linear ground response analysis, where based on some initial approximation of shear modulus and damping ratio, the governing equation of motion is solved. In the end, we will get the value of shear strain, which will be compared with respect to initially assumed value of shear strain. If the value of two value uh, two shear strains are matching, then we will consider the assumed value of shear modulus and damping ratio as final dynamic soil properties. If this is not matching, then again we will go for next step of revising the value of shear modulus and damping ratio. So, generally whenever we are going with equivalent linear ground response analysis, we will be having some discrete points which are defining the nonlinear dynamic soil properties and every time we are revising these properties depending upon whether the assumed value of shear strain is matching with the value of shear strain you are getting at the end of your solution or not. However, the fact is the soil behavior under dynamic loading condition is non-linear that means there will be complete degradation in the material properties as the loading and unloading continues for a particular soil medium during earthquake loading condition. So, though equivalent linear analysis is going to approximate the solution for ground response analysis, non-linear analysis will give more accurate solution 
primarily whenever we are looking for development of pore water pressure or degradation in the material characteristics or when we are interested to find out the response under extreme loading conditions. In such a case, non-linear ground response analysis is going to approximate or it is going to give more accurate results as far as the local side effect or ground response analysis is concerned. So, equivalent linear analysis, it was an approximation related to non-linear analysis. Alternative way where which we can find out the non-linear way or non-linear behavior of the soil is one can go with non-linear ground response analysis. So, in non-linear ground response analysis, we will try to find out how during the duration of earthquake loading, how the soil sample is changing its response in terms of stress strain behavior, which is approximated with respect to stress time history or strain time history values. So, mostly the, the loading and unloading characteristics because we are talking about cyclic loading conditions. So, there will be loading, there will be unloading and this will be repeated over the duration of earthquake loading condition. So, this loading and unloading characteristics or the cyclic loading of the soil will be approximated by means of backbone curve. Usually, whenever we are discussing about nonlinear response of the soil, we are interested to find out, we, we are interested to approximate how this backbone curve be, can be approximated by means of suitable constitutive model. So, the most important aspect of nonlinear analysis is what constitutive model of a particular soil. One is assuming in order to understand how during the loading characteristics of earthquake on a particular soil layer, how the soil is going to respond such that the model of the, the behavior of the soil approximated by a constitutive model is closely matching with the backbone curve of the soil which is resembling the actual response. So, the integration is performed in small time steps that means, we will take uh, uh, we will try to uh, find out the particle velocity and then corresponding to those particle velocity at some moment of time, we will try to find out the ground motion characteristics. Again, we will try to revise it for next increment of time that is delta t value. Again, try to find out corresponding to that how much is the particle velocity and going with the same procedure, we will try to approximate where the final value of shear strain and corresponding value of modulus and damping characteristics will be uh, approximated. So, the nonlinear behavior is modeled using hyperbolic function, which is how the stress strain behavior of a cyclically loaded soil can be approximated. That is approximated by means of hyperbolic function, which is giving you a close approximation with respect to your backbone curve representing the nonlinear behavior of the soil. So, uh, widely adopted constitutive model you can say is mesing criteria and extended mesing criteria which can be used to how, how the stress strain curve of the soil can be approximated using governing equations such that one can understand about nonlinear soil behavior. So, certain rules are there under uh, mesing criteria. The first rule because we will be approximating the stress strain curve with respect to the backbone curve. So, how the stress strain curve can be approximated or can be closely matched with the actual response of the soil that is described by the backbone curve. So, the first rule is the stress strain curve follows the backbone curve for initial loading. That means, whenever soil will be subjected to external loading condition, the very first cycle of loading will be following the backbone curve. The, that means, the nature of the curve will be similar to your backbone curve of the material. Rule 2 says that during stress reversal, because we are talking about cyclic loading conditions. So, there will be application of load and after certain moment of time, you will see that the nature of loading, if, if it initially was compression, the nature of loading will change to tension, which can be indicated by means of upward and downward movement or acceleration values on either side of the axis in your ground motion record. So, during stress reversal, which is indication like if the particle was moving in one direction because of cyclic loading, the particle is coming back to its mean position and then started moving in other direction. Similarly, there can be also approximated with respect to unloading characteristics because now you are removing the loading. So, 
the, the particle will come back to its original position and there will be stress reversal. Similarly, whenever it comes to reloading that means again there will be next cycle of loading which will be applied from earthquake loading condition because earthquake loading condition is cyclic in nature. So, there will be reversal of stresses continuously. So, if we are interested to see a typical response that is with respect to time the value of acceleration or similarly the velocity and displacement value how these are changing with respect to mean position. So, one time it is going up other time it is going down that is called as stress reversal or loading in first cycle and then unloading in second cycle or once it crosses the mean position it is going for unloading part. So, this is approximated and again this can be have that, that will have same shape as that of backbone curve. So, initial loading will be approximated to backbone curve primarily the shape and the unloading and reloading because of the cyclic loading characteristics of the soil uh, of the earthquake loading will also have similar shape as that of backbone curve. The next part is if the load if the unloading or reloading curve intersects that means you are talking about actual loading which is which you are estimating from stress time history. If that particular loading and unloading are also intersecting at some moment of time at or at some level of effective stress to the backbone curve that means it follows the backbone curve until the next level of stress or the second cycle of loading is applied to the soil sample. Rule 4 says if the loading or reloading unloading and reloading intersect with the unloading or reloading part from the previous cycle that means the nature of strain or the, the value of strain from the previous cycle and the current cycle matches then the curve follows the stress strain path or trajectory of the previous loading cycle itself. So, that means same nature of stress will keep on repeating if at any moment of time the unloading or reloading curve matches the stress strain curve of previous loading. So, this all can be approximated or can be understood based on a typical stress time history curve. So, you can see over here how the shear stress is varying with respect to time during earthquake loading condition which can be generated from acceleration time history record from a uh, from an earthquake record recorded at a ground motion recording instrument. So, this is a stress time history which will also suggest you there will be reversal of stresses and then at the same time you can also find out corresponding to different value of stresses or level of loading what is the shear strain applicable. This is the backbone curve which is which is going to give you the response of the soil corresponding to cyclic loading condition which has to be approximated by means of assuming some suitable constitutive model. So, if you are going with this backbone curve the first is point A which is initiation of loading that means your sample has just experienced external loading this is point A and then once it reaches loading. So, as per rule 1 it will follow the backbone curve shape. So, initial loading will follow the uh, backbone curve shape that was rule number 1 and then stress reversal that means once your loading reaches to point B again there will be reversal of stresses. So, it will come down and while coming down the unloading curve will in case it is intersecting your backbone curve it will continue following your backbone curve till there is again reversal of stresses that means second cycle of loading once it is coming into picture till that moment after point C the stress strain curve will follow your backbone curve. That is why even between C and point D your backbone curve is following and the stress strain curve is following your backbone curve. Again there will be a second cycle of loading that will be called as stress reversal because initially there was loading then stress reversal again stress reversal means second cycle of loading we will start from point D and then that will continue till point E. So, definitely as the loading cycle continues initially there will be like initially some traces of or, or some initial loading will come and then after some duration gap you will have peak ground acceleration values. So, that means in general 
after some moment it will be increased loading with respect to initial loading condition which is indicated by point E and since point E is also located on backbone curve. So, unless till the moment it reaches to the second cycle of loading or uh, unloading it will follow the backbone curve. So, this nature which is overall the soil behavior is following a backbone curve and a constitutive model which is defined by missing criteria and extended missing criteria here that is basically defining the nature in which you are approximating the loading and unloading cycles of a particular soil medium using uh, nonlinear curve. So, governing equation for this particular uh, missing criteria can be referred and uh, based on this one can find out what is the approximate nonlinear behavior. So, this will continue number of cycles will continue and reversal of stress and unloading will continue. So, procedure for nonlinear and ground response analysis firstly you will find out the value of particle um, oscillation velocity and displacement values at each of these layers. Then estimate the value of shear strain within each layer with respect to which you can find out the value of shear stress within each layer using stress strain curve as suggested by a constitutive model following a nonlinear response or hysteresis loop and then determine the value of ground motion at the base because now you have to go with incremental stresses uh, steps in terms of time. So, there will be additional uh, time step that is delta t. Accordingly, you can find out the level of ground motion in other layers also from the top to bottom and the procedure will be repeated for every time step. So, this is initially you start at some moment of time t, repeat it for plus delta t plus delta t and so on till you are able to cover the entire loading uh, cycle. So, uh, collectively nonlinear ground response analysis captures the nonlinear behavior of the soil better primarily when we are talking about strong ground motions and uh, last is it can also capture the behavior of in, in terms of pore water pressure. So, whenever uh, there is significant development of pore water pressure nonlinear analysis will be more effective in terms of understanding the governing mechanism at the site. So, that was all. Thank you everyone.